Always was into it. Yeah. But then obviously the whole addiction thing happened. Yeah. So I kind of stopped like partaking in that hobby of like taking Ooh. pictures and video. So like your addiction pulled you out of creativity. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people slip into it because they are under the myth that it like enhances their creativity, stuff like Some that. Some do, but yeah. I was so out of my mind. Like yeah. the drug I was taking, it was just like blackout. There was, I guess that does depend on what kind of drug yes. you're doing. Yeah. Yes. A hundred percent. Yeah. So then when I got sober, I'm like, wow, I have like free time now that I'm not getting high. <laughs> right. It is like you're yeah. getting part of your life back. You're like, oh man, yeah. After 5 p.m., there's stuff I can do. Like, <laughs> I didn't realize. Yeah, like, okay, cool, 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 yeah. And I also never saw myself as a creative person whatsoever. I struggle with that still, yeah. It's like, I don't have original ideas. <laughs> you know what I mean? The thing I think that is most freeing to realize about that is no one has original ideas. And that's another thing yeah. I've learned throughout the process. It's just we might do it a little differently. Yeah. Everyone's different slant is... Um, you know, worth exploring. Yeah. Even if it is, you're just doing Romeo and Juliet again. Like there's a whole genre of movies that are like that, yeah. you know, but I cry every time, you know, cause they're great and yeah. it's everyone's spin or it's, you know, it's two women this time or it's two men or it's, you know, red, white, and Royal blue, you know, one's a, pr you know, prime minister's son and one's a, the president's son, yeah. whatever. Like there's stuff like that, that it's more or less the same story beats different slants yeah. and different viewpoints. So yes. I love that. But if I wouldn't say that that person is like reinventing the wheel, they just have a different take on the wheel. Honestly, but some people do reinvent. They that's true. Something but new. I ain't that kind of revolutionary. <laughs> like that's, that's too much pressure for me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to let like Stephen King have that. <laughs> and you know, those kind of people. Right. So then when I got sober, I was like, okay, maybe I can actually, like I was getting inspired a little bit. Yeah. And my SoundCloud rapper friend was like, let's, make a video yeah and i was like dude you know what that would be sick like this would be amazing and then that's when i was i invested in a camera yeah and then so you got your first camera to shoot that music video yes oh, i love like that. just to like start you know this yeah. whole process yeah. of like making things and that's so kind of where it started that's awesome would you say that you replaced your uh addiction with creative work i honestly wouldn't say so okay that's great I, yeah yeah. It's like, I think I have a healthy balance, but like now that I'm creating content for fuck the stigma, I'm trying to find a balance of like making my personal things. If that makes sense. It does make sense. Yes. Yeah. Especially, I, I mean, my career largely, my day job career has largely been a balance of making content for various companies, you know, whoever was employing me at the time and then making my own content, you know? Yeah. And that's difficult. Like working at five in the creative field, you know, eight to five or whatever your day job is and then going home and being like, Oh, I have to do that same like workflow for myself. And that can be difficult. Seriously. I struggle with it. Cause it's like, sometimes I need a break. I don't know. It's like, I'm, I, I like put a lot of energy into the stuff I do with fuck the stigma. And then I'm kind yeah. of just like, I'm going to relax. And then now it's been a while since I've made something for myself. Yeah. You need to and find like, another SoundCloud rapper. <laughs> And film that single location music video that he's been Sing dying to film. The single location. Yeah, can I ask you a question about that? That was yeah. the first thing you did, right? Or the first major like production you worked on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask a personal question you may want to cut of out? Of course. Did you accept any payment for that? No, I didn't. That yeah. was for fun. Yeah. So and, giggles. That's... and it was like gratifying. Yeah. Like, I felt so, the feeling I get when I'm like, when I finish editing or even during the process oh, of like, yeah. oh, I can do this, this, and this, and I this. I know. Yeah. And you're like. Oh my God, I did that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It's an amazing the reason I ask is because I, that's how it's always been for me. Every time I wanted to learn something new or someone asked me to do something because of various other things I've done, but it was a little bit outside the realm of what I'd done before. I had, I was always like, yes, let's do it. And we wouldn't charge them because I wouldn't, I would feel bad if it wasn't great, you know? Yeah. So like. I get insecure about yeah. the work being good or not. Even with photography, right. like with photography as well. I'm like. Yeah. Are you more comfortable with video? Is that why? Yeah. Yeah. Probably. I am too, honestly, which it sounds like it should be the other way around. Right. But photography to me feels more like painting and videography to yeah. me feels more like it, capturing moments. Yeah. Which feels like less the, pressure. Yeah. That's what I was just about yeah. to say. With a picture, there's so much pressure on like that one picture. Yes, one frame. Good. That's yes. one frame. Yeah, it's that's way more pressure to me. Although I've heard people say the other way around. So that's it's probably just that I'm more comfortable with videography. 
Yeah. But that's what I grew up in. That's the world I grew up in. And then you have your own podcast. Yeah, I have two. Yeah. So uh, about six years ago, we started The Horror Virgin, which is uh, a podcast where I don't I don't like scary movies, but I have some friends that make me watch them. So that was like the premise of the show. I had a friend Being who came to me. forced to watch scary movies. Well, not forced. <laughs> I mean, I, I did sign it, sort of sign up, but like I wouldn't watch scary movies outside of that. Yeah. I wouldn't. I don't like them. I'm still scared of them. I don't. <laughs> I don't like the I, I don't like the uh, feeling of being like startled. I think so. Like jump scares that, really get me. And that's I like hate a it. comforting feeling to me sometimes. What? Like a little spookiness. It's like uh, a little I don't spookiness. Know. A little like atmospheric spookiness. Like like a, the Conjuring, where it's like the tension starting to build. That's fine. It's when someone like jumps out at you and there's like the big musical stinger and you stand up and yell "fuck" in the theater, like I did <laughs> when I was watching Hereditary in the theater. It was terrifying. That's the scariest movie I've ever seen, personally. But um, yeah, I don't, I can't handle that. And you love that? I don't. I wouldn't say I love it, but it's okay. like I can see the appeal of being into horror movies. Oh, I definitely understand why people like it. It's just not my favorite. Like thing. I love a good eerie feeling. Yeah, and there are some like man, the horror comedies I really love because they're not really scary; they're just funny. And now that I've seen so many, because we've done like three hundred and thirty some episodes, so I've seen three hundred and thirty some horror movies. Like I. I understand the tropes that the horror comedies are making fun of. So there's a lot. Of, I, I do enjoy that a lot. We also have a romantic comedy movie that I enjoy watching them or a podcast that I enjoy watching those movies a lot more yeah. for because they're great. So it's funny because we were talking a little bit earlier about podcasting yeah. and then kind of like how we got started in this, which is like, oh, I started with really bad music videos. Yeah. Like now I have a podcast and this is something I never would have imagined myself doing at all. Yeah. Especially because I never saw myself as somebody that could have like that could articulate my words well. Oh, really? You never saw yourself as like a public speaker? A public speaker or just having conversations that are being filmed and that <laughs> might actually mean something. <laughs> yeah, I find that interesting that it's like, oh, this is what I'm doing. And I actually kind of enjoy it. Yeah, I have found that over the course of having the podcast and just... I guess my career in the creative space, I've gotten way better at talking to people and 100%. just like really being present in conversations. Like I remember being so scattered as a kid and like even up through college and stuff. And it was hard for me to stay focused on one thing at a time or even like one conversation. Mm -hmm. And now I can really um, like focus in on like what the conversation is, where it's going and really just be present with that other person. Right. And I love that. That's one of the things that I think I've learned that I think has helped me most in like the world outside of creativity. Cause like I'm a better fiance because of that. <laughs> like, I, you know, I can like, I'm more so of an oh, active so, listener. So that's where the bowls go in the cabinet. My bad. <laughs> you know, like you, you're just better and you're more present. So that's one of the things that I think that uh, that and therapy, I think I've done a lot to help me with that kind of 100%. stuff. But. It's interesting. Cause like now I see so much more of like a story Yes. With conversation. Well, yeah. You're trying to pull like, out a you're trying to pull out narratives for people. Yeah. yeah. So like when <laughs> I think it's very funny because we have two people who like professionally podcast interview people interviewing each other or talking and we're both trying to interview each other. It's funny. <laughs> but but I, I, do, I definitely understand like that impulse. And I do that even when I'm talking to like my friends and family outside of like the podcast, I'm always like, oh, is that when you met this person and that led to these things, mom, like when we're talking and because I'm trying to build the narrative for everyone else there, it's like, yeah, I have like, this weird producer brain <laughs> in the conversation that I can't turn off. Yeah. Yeah. It's bad. Sometimes like, yeah, truly I'm in an everyday conversation with the person and it's like, yeah. why do I feel like, actually, I feel like I'm interviewing you right now and I catch myself. I, I've become um, like weirdly obsessed with context. Like, does everyone here know the context of this, yes, what's going on? Exactly. Because that is something when editing like a podcast episode, it's I'm like, like, wait, the audience didn't know <laughs> the backstory with this. They're not going to get that call back if yeah. they didn't know that first video was at a single location, you know, like they're <laughs> not going to get it, you know? So like, yeah. I, I've sort of become weirdly obsessed with that when like talking to friends. I'm like, did you guys know that Dave did this thing? Okay, cool. Tell the story. Dave. And now you can tell yeah. the story, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's fun. It's a fun process. And you also said you were kind of thrown into starting the podcast. That wasn't something you initially, it wasn't something I even really considered. So I, um, the idea for the podcast actually was brought up to me about four years before we started it. 
Um, and it was a good friend of mine, Clint, who wanted to do it. He loves, loves horror movies. And I had done a podcast with him, uh, a, a year before or so that didn't really go anywhere largely because it was terrible. And like we talked about before, the first things creatively we put out are not great. There are good, like, like flag in the sand of like where we started. <laughs> Yes, but, but you need to just start. Yes. And that's also a whole yes. other thing with content creation. Um, I and have I have a lot of like rules to follow and like how to how to be creative and like all of that stuff. I've done a lot of thinking about that because I've been doing it for a long time. And I used to think that it was like a tank that would run out. And I was worried that like I can only be so creative in a day. And I realized that that's just my brain works that way. I think a lot of my creative friends are a little bit off mentally and I mean like off like bad but they're different you know yeah a lot of us struggle with addiction or addictive type personalities our brains just work differently a lot of us have ADHD like it's that kind of stuff I so I like think there might be some thing. like legitimacy to like hyper creative people it's just like something that's wrong with their brain not wrong but like different about their brain yeah. um, but because of that and like being okay with that and learning that that is not a tank that's going to run dry I just know that if I put in the repetitions, it's going to be good. And I'm going to, I'm going to continue to be creative. It's not something that I'm going to have to worry about running out of, but that doesn't mean everything I create is great. Yeah. You know, I've uh, been writing music for like 20 years and uh, that was the first thing creatively I did like back in high school. And I have a, a writing partner that we still write music together occasionally and we'll just write songs sometimes and we're like, oh man, this is the worst thing we've written in years. <laughs> this is bad. No one yeah, should yeah. hear this. And we yeah. put it in a drawer and we never talk about it. And we write the next song. You know, a lot of it is about getting repetitions and getting through the bad stuff to find the good stuff. Yeah. But you also have to like have a very good relationship with failure to do it, which mm. I have worked a lot also on. Rejection, therapy. I feel. I, well, OK, so, yes, there are two things. <laughs> there's rejection and there's failure. Failure is what you feel. Rejection is what you feel from other people. And when you put something creatively out into the world, what the feedback you get will mostly be negative, especially early on. You'll have a lot of people who are like, man, that sucks. I hate it. Here's why. And like, they'll be very honest with you about why they hate it. But what they really hate is the fact that they aren't themselves doing something else, that yeah. they themselves aren't putting themselves out there or being vulnerable with society like mm -hmm. that or feel like they have something worth sharing. So like a lot of that negativity that comes back at you, that has nothing to do with you. They just ignore all that. That is something that that person needs to work through in their own therapy. I have nothing to do with that. That's you and your dad's relationship or whatever, you know, for me, it was just, what have you done? If I respect what you've done, you can give me feedback on what I've done outside of that. I'm not really super interested in what people think Yeah, because I have a very specific voice. I have a very specific personality that I play up on the podcast some, but it's very much myself and that's not for everybody and that's okay. It is for a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, so I'm going to do that. You know, you also got to get really com comfortable with failure because everyone fails, even whether you're in creative spaces or not. I think I have a very big fear of failure, but I also think I validate. I try and yeah. validate that on fear, my fear. Do you mean it. like I'm afraid to fail and you validate that feeling? It's like I'm so scared of failure, but I also want to believe that I'm a failure so bad. Yeah. That I do things to like make me feel like I'm a failure, almost like out of comfort. Oh, like Does a self-defeating prophecy yes. almost, but one that makes you feel comforted because you're like, see, I am a failure. Yes. Yeah. That. I struggled with that. <laughs> I would say largely yeah. I still struggle with things like imposter syndrome. Like, oh, um, that too. That's we, real um, One my co-host, um, Paige Wesley, is uh, a comedian in L.A. and she is pretty big in the roast battle scene out there. So I got invited to do a roast and I had never... I had never done stand up really. And now I'm on stage at the comedy store in LA Ooh, and I have to there. tell, yeah, I performed there. It was crazy. I, I was like in a room with people who were way funnier than me. And I had, I was one of the early ones. So I, I only had three jokes. Like that's all, that's all I was allowed to tell. Cause I was like roasting somebody and it was, I was very nervous. It was like way out too. of my element. So like I understand and I was so afraid of failing and like all of that stuff. But let me ask you a question. What was the last thing you failed at? And what did you learn from it? 
What was the last thing I felt that of? <laughs> <laughs> said, the, said the person who was just like, oof, sometimes I like to fail because it feels comforting. That's what you just said. I guess my point is failing is great. That You paid a lot to learn that lesson through whatever that failure was. So learn that lesson, but don't let it stop you from using what you learned to make better stuff or do your job better or whatever. And like not everyone who fails is in a creative field. You know, you could just like, fail at being an accountant, but you still learn something from that. Like, I don't know. I think about accounting, so I don't know what you'd be. I forgot how to do this thing in Excel or whatever you would fail at. But like, you won't forget that next time because you paid that price through that failure. So I've learned to sort of embrace my failure and like, look back at that on like, those are the lessons that I paid to learn. And I, I do sort of like look back at my life and like, I, in my section, in my life, there's like sections. I have the time in my life where I was like a touring professional musician and I failed at that. And I had the time in my life where I was a professional partner Twitch streamer and I failed at that. And now I'm doing podcasting. (laughs) But along the way, like I learned so much about sound design, doing the music and how to produce when I was doing the music. And I moved from just audio into video with the Twitch stuff. And I learned how to do all of that. And now I use all of those skills to do both my day job (laughs) and my podcast. Like yeah. I didn't go to school for any of that. Yeah. What I graduated from school from was like business. I could have been an accountant, but like, because my brain is broken and I <laughs> am creative, I guess I had to do other things. And so all of that work and all of that, all of those skills, I should say that yeah. I learned, I learned through failure. And it's funny. I'm, I'm literally 21 years old. People are like, Lysha, you will fail. And honestly, please fail. Yeah. Like you need to learn. I'll, honestly, and embrace yeah. it. Just be like, Oh man, I fucked up here. <laughs> <laughs> like ugh, uh, that it happens yeah. like and you want to surround yourself with people who like when they see you fail, their approach is, oh, man, I'm sorry that happened to you. How can I help? You know, how can I help you like move through? Move, that are, yeah. yeah, yeah. If they can help. It depends on the type of failure, I suppose. But yeah, you want to surround yourself with people like that and people like creative partners that you're very comfortable being vulnerable around because um, yeah. you cannot. I don't think you can be creative without some sense of vulnerability. vulnerability. Yeah. Well, I think maybe you can, but you'd have to keep that creativity to yourself. I think the vulnerable part is Ooh, sharing it with the world. That's so true. Um, Cause that's when you're like, Hey, this is, especially with like, we were talking about this earlier, but like with like music, a lot of that's just poetry. And mm-hmm. it's like people writing like love songs or I can't imagine more vulnerable things. And it's just like, do you like this thing I wrote about, you know, my girlfriend or my fiance or my wife thing. or, you know, whatever, you know? So that's where a lot of people struggle is just putting it out there. Yeah. Like a lot of people want to make a video and post it on YouTube. They're just a little shy, scared of the judgment yeah. and all these other things. Well, the good thing about the YouTube is there's so much on there that when you put your video on YouTube, you will probably still be the only person that watches it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and that can also keep you from posing. Cause you're like, yeah. Oh, I'm so insignificant. It doesn't matter if I share it. Well, so there's some freedom in that, though, right? When yeah. you're at a certain level and um, you know people will pay attention to the things that you do, you do feel a little bit of responsibility. Yeah. Uh, and maybe even fear of some backlash yeah. to really sort of go at the wild swings you want to take or would have taken earlier. The hard thing is to do that kind of stuff at a higher level and then it not go well, which I've done. Like, that's that can be bad, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but you learn from that and you move on and you, you know, apologize or like maybe don't wear that thing again or whatever you took a swing at, you know, you're like, Oh, boots aren't for me or whatever, you know, Uh, or, you know, like whatever, you know, even with fuck the stigma, like a lot of the things we post is like opinionated and like specific to people's of experiences. Course. Yeah. Cause you're telling true life stories. But like, then I also do share education and yeah. then even sometimes with that people are like, Oh, Hey, that's not true. We've debunked this. Yeah. So you should correct that. I'm like, Oh fuck. And then like, I get a little embarrassed. I get shit for it. Yeah. And then we move on. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I, yeah. Man, I have, um, I have, that happens to me a lot, yeah. a lot, a lot, a lot on the show. Uh, and I've gotten to a point where I, I, I whenever I state something that's like, I'm stating as a fact, I try to make it sound like it's an opinion (laughs) because then I can be like, oh, I just didn't know. I'm so sorry. And you sort of have the out of, hey, I think it's actually this because that's the way you set it up when you brought it up on the podcast or whatever. You're like, I think it might be it's best that, you know, whatever. I don't know what fact you're sharing, but if you share it like it's an opinion, (laughs) people 
tend to be like, oh, that's just them. That's just what they think. They may not have read this thing. But if you're like, no, it's definitely this way, people are like, oh, it's definitely not it's that It's every way. time I'm like, it's definitely this. Yes. That's where I fuck up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 100%. So I, I, and it's just because people are less offended, I think, by people's opinions than they are of people's facts. And I say it that way because I'm using facts very, like, loosely. <laughs> people's opinions can sometimes bleed into that. But if you position it as a fact, they're going to want to correct you. If you position it as an opinion, they probably aren't. Very true. Yeah. I also want to hear a little bit about what you said about imposter syndrome. I mean, that's something I think everyone I know that's creative struggles with. I actually know people who aren't like they wouldn't classify themselves creative. They have a nine to five corporate job and they struggle with imposter syndrome. Yeah. First, let's define it. Yes. What's your definition? Your own, <laughs> your own definition of imposter syndrome. So I think the thing I struggle with most uh, with imposter syndrome, and, and this may help with the definition part is it's really just me um, struggling with feeling like I am not worthy to be where I am. I should not be in this room having this conversation with these people. Yes. Why are they letting me make these decisions? Why do I have do, a don't voice? Don't these impact revenue? Like they don't, they, yeah. So like all of that stuff, all the way through to like my creative side where I'm like, why do, because the podcasts do pretty well and we do like live shows and I'm like, it, People will do like meet and greets afterwards and they're coming up and hugging. I don't know these people, but they're hugging me and we're like taking photos together. And that's probably the most I struggle with imposter syndrome because yeah. I'm just like a I'm like a VP of marketing for a SaaS company who is silly and has two movie podcasts. <laughs> that's not very interesting. But these people like listen every week and they know me really well. Respect you. I don't they they listen. They probably don't <laughs> respect me all that much. But <laughs> but they I think that and I'm assuming, I'm assuming you listen to podcasts too, because you work in the medium, but like funny enough, I kind of don't. Yeah. I mean, th there's, <laughs> but like you do consume media, right? Yes. So that the things that you consume, you sort of are drawn to and like, they mean something to you. So like, I don't listen to Joe Rogan at all. If I ran into Joe Rogan, I'd be like, Oh, Hey, it's Joe Rogan. Nice. We work in similar, <laughs> in similar fields. And mm -hmm. he would be like, I've never heard of you, but, and move on quickly. But, um, for me, it's like, I feel like the worst friend at those moments because they know so much about me and I don't know anything about them. So a lot of times during those moments where I'm dealing with imposter syndrome, I learn to like turn it around on the moment and focus on the moment or them even because I don't like I was saying before, I don't know anything about them and it's like their life is more interesting to me. So when they're asking me all the questions that I've said a thousand times on the podcast, I'll just start asking them where they're from or like, what are they doing? Yeah, or like, did you come here with anybody? And I then like I started, that's what I would do. In the yeah. It's, as well. it's so much. Uh, and I, and the th and I'm generally interested. I, I, I actually do really love talking to people and, um, in my work, my day job, I go to conventions all the time and I'm the worst at like standing at a booth and talking about a product. I'm like, so where are you guys from? <laughs> oh, awesome. How long was the flight? <laughs> You know, like I, I and so then, like we're not talking about like yeah, why we're here. <laughs> that's the problem. And I, I, I'm a VP of marketing in my day job. So like I will occasionally have those conversations. And then one of the people at the booth who's like a salesperson will come over and like help guide the conversation to a more productive mean means. But uh, I'm the worst at that because I just want to know everything about you as a person. Like what makes you tick? Like I, if I could immediately jump deep into conversations with people, I would, but it would weird them out. Right. Cause like the stuff I want to know is like, what is your personal philosophy on the world and how did you develop it? Like those kind of questions. Those are the conversations. That's all I, I mean care about. And that's what I love about this podcast. <laughs> yeah. is that like, that's why you're coming. Yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I like that there are spaces to have those conversations. And I think that it's great that there, are, and you're not the only one that has a podcast similar to this, but like, I think that it's great that there are public spaces where people can go yeah. see those people be vulnerable and like talk about their therapy journeys or their addiction struggles or whatever it is that they've struggled with. I think that that's great. Um, cause it shows I just speaking as like a guy who grew up in a pretty toxic, like Southern culture, uh, it teaches people how to be vulnerable with their friend groups and like that kind of stuff. And that's something that I struggled with a lot. Same. So how do you deal with imposter syndrome? So I, first of all, with fuck the stigma, that's where I mainly suffer from imposter syndrome. Yeah. Also recovery and like the fact that I was able to get out at 18 and other people weren't. Yeah. It's like I received this amazing opportunity to find recovery and like, why didn't they get that? You know what I mean? Like yeah. that. And like now I'm like still sober. My three years is tomorrow. Hey, that's great. So three years ago today was my last drink. 
That's amazing. And yeah, and it's so cool. And it's like the f- and you're 21. I'm 21. You can now legally drink. I could now. And you're legally. now three years sober. Yes. Nice. Yeah, it's very funny. And I struggle with that because like I've literally had like close friends like pass away, and it's Same. like it's just fucking frustrating that yeah. like why did I get this opportunity and they didn't? Yeah. So that imposter syndrome with that kind of, and then the fact that I even have the opportunity to run a platform where I can like share my story and experiences. Yeah. And that I have this like almost, it feels like power to be able to like, just, I don't disagree. Put all of this out there. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is (laughs) platforms do, you know, they have some have, influence. They do. Um, speaking from a, like my day job perspective, the marketing perspective, we use influencer marketing all the time to do various things. I, I used it very successfully to grow my own personal podcast, you know, reaching out to influ- influencers and sending them merchandise to use in posts and yeah. stuff like that. And, you know, that kind of stuff is why th- that that is a lucrative path for influencers to take because it's worth it. It's worth to invest in. But I. I feel an immense amount of responsibility because of that Um, to both like every Monday and Thursday, a new episode has to come out. I feel an immense amount of responsibility to the community that we've built of listeners to get that out. Right. Um, And it's just, it's a lot of responsibility. The thing that I look at with the imposter syndrome specifically is especially for like where you are and how you ended up here. It doesn't really matter how you feel about, where you are and how you got to where you are because other people put you here because they knew you could do it. You know, you don't necessarily have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in those people who hired you to do it. And then Mm -hmm. the audience, if the audience resonates with it, then you know, you're doing something right. But I, I try not to think about things like imposter syndrome much, but I find that it's a lot. It creeps up. sometimes. Yeah. It weighs on you a lot, whether you actively give it focus or not. So I, I definitely understand the struggle, but you're doing great. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And that's another thing, which is fun. like, I love, thank you. I love praise. Like I love yeah. people telling me I'm doing a good job. Your words of s- affirmation kind of person yes, is what you're saying. Yeah. Love them. <laughs> but at the same time, I want you to tell me where I'm fucking up oh, and yeah. what I can fix. And yeah. I don't get that enough. Yeah. I think that that's learning to surround yourself with people who will be honest with you, um, I think is important. And that's hard yeah. because a lot of people, especially once you get to a certain like level, they just want to, not everybody. The fear for me maybe is that, does this person genuinely want to be my friend or are they just trying to do this because they also have a podcast and they want to be on the show? You know, they want a guest or whatever. So like that's hard and navigating that relationship can be difficult. It's easier to develop like a core group of people like that you can get feedback from at a lower level and just hang on to those people uh, as long as you like trust their input and value it. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it can be hard because like, are you only giving me this feedback because, or, you know, you need something from me or is it a genuine relationship? Mm-hmm. It can be hard. Yes. That's another thing I feel like I've gotten better with over time is like truly like knowing in my gut whose opinions I value. Yeah. And that's honestly, it should be a short list. I'll be honest yeah. with you. Yeah. Cause, and the, the reason I say this is because, and I know you know this because you put stuff online uh, and honestly are a woman and that's worse uh, online. <laughs> I, I like, I understand that. Oh, another white guy with a podcast. Like it's easier for me than it is for you to exist online. I don't love that. I think that's terrible, but like that's, that is true. So you probably know this way more than me. But anytime you put something online, you're going to get a ton of feedback that is very negative. So, yeah, ignore all of that. Like I was saying before, what have you done that would warrant you being able to have any sort of knowledge that would give me valuable feedback? Right. You know? And it's like, especially with what the fuck we talk about, but it's also why I think I'm a great fit for Fuck the Stigma. It's like, yeah, I'm a woman. I'm young, Dominican, like minority, lesbian. Yeah addict yeah <laughs> struggle with mental health it's like all these different things piercings tattoos i'm gonna get shit for days yeah yeah i mean if i get shit and i do and uh, you know everyone does <laughs> yeah. i just think it's easier for me because of how terrible it is to exist online <laughs> i mean I, I truly i think at this stage of my life 
probably wouldn't have social media if not for my my podcasts and like the creative side of things that I want to yeah. produce. And but I, know, I have my moments where I'm like, I wish I could delete it, but I kind of can't. Yeah, I was driving here. I was talking to my fiance because we do this thing where like. Uh, when I travel for work, we like talk for hours every day <laughs> because like I love her and yeah, she's great. Of uh, but <laughs> but we were talking on the way here and she was like asking me if I had seen something in the election stuff. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm I'm actively trying not to pay attention. I already know who I'm going to vote for. I have no there's no reason for me to like care what fucking J.D. Vance is saying, <laughs> you know. And then like the next few months are just going to be brutal. Yeah. Anytime I open any social yeah. media politics is the I know, first thing it's so it's so hard for me to disconnect from that and i get so anxious and it's just it honestly can kill a vibe for me very quickly yeah. and i know that like when you're you know this like when you're having conversations with people or like when you're recording an episode like finding that groove and locking in like it, in drumming we call it like living in the pocket like mm. finding that pocket in a conversation and staying in that pocket is so important to creating good content especially like what I would say are in the improv realms or just like conversations, you know, I, we don't, this isn't scripted, you know? So like finding that groove is so hard. And then when you do, if you like disconnect for a second, cause I have ADHD, I do that all the time. And I look yeah. at my phone and I'm on Twitter or whatever, and I'm seeing some crazy shit. Like it's like now your head, I know so now much. I'm out of the pocket and I can't, I, I want to stay present in the moment. And so that's, and we talked about it a little bit earlier. Like that's one thing that I think I've gotten better at. And I think part of that was consciously like just knowing I know who I'm going to vote for. She's great. I'm going to move. I'm not going to focus on anything else going forward. It is what it is. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm just not going to tune in and let that ruin my life. Yeah. It's really hard. It is it hard. It really fucks. Certain things I see really fuck with, yeah. like subconsciously, like it fucks with my day. Like there's certain I days I feel more unsafe than others. And there's other days I feel more insecure because of just like what I saw on social media. Yeah. It's like crazy the effect it has on your, and your, I on don't your think health. you're wrong to feel that way. Yeah. You know, I think that there are very rare reasons all of us should feel that way on some level. And I don't want to have to experience that every day. I know that my small part of this is to do what I can civically do to help. And I'm, I've already made my decision, so I'm not going to tune in very much. Yeah. If anything crazy happens, which thankfully nothing crazy has happened in the past two months. So, um, you know, it's, I don't know. You don't think anything crazy has happened in the past Oh, two no. Months? Clearly, I was joking. We had a, <laughs> an assassination attempt and an incumbent well, no, step down. Please. What's a really crazy but love you, God moment. I So I went to Europe, but yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. you know, brainstorming like content of like what we should do. And I was like, we should go to a Trump rally <sighs> to interview people. And like the closest one to here. No, yeah. I was going to go to the Butler, Pennsylvania one. But it was like, oh, I'm out of town. But otherwise, I would totally go. So imagine, like, I wasn't leaving town. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to go film content. He, that would have been crazy. Yes, it would have been crazy. <laughs> I just Fuck the stigma assassination <laughs> episode. Like, it would have been crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was really just, that was a moment of, like, wow. Moment in time. I'm, <laughs> uh, like, don't get me wrong. I am so glad that, like, it did, the, the, they did, he didn't die, you yeah. know? There was a guy who did die. That's very sad. Mm -hmm. But I do think it would have been worse if Trump had died. That would have been nuts. Yeah. I don't understand how I don't understand how we got here as a country. Like, I don't. Like, when I was growing up, my dad voted for Reagan. Like, my dad was a Republican. And now it's like, man, that's not at all. It's it's just, it's crazy that we are yeah. here now. Yeah, it's, we're, in like, I feel like in a very divided place with a lot of different things like yes yes the the republican democrat situation very divided but like even on a lot of other things like with what we talk about as an organization with addiction and mental health yeah all of that and it was funny like when i went to europe like there's so many other people that are like very interested and involved in american politics as well oh yeah and i like that blew my mind i'm like how do you know what's going on in america like i'm in because it affects them yeah yeah which is something i learned i'm like wow it's actually kind of like a relevant was that your first it was my first international time. trip like outside of adult, north america as in a yes okay outside of north america okay i was yeah. actually in the uk earlier this year as well i love it i, I love would it move too. there in a heartbeat if i could live anywhere it'd be edinburgh i love edinburgh really yeah i didn't go there this trip um because this trip i specifically went to get engaged 
Um, so I went to, um, we went to the London and the Cotswolds and then Wales and then back, um, mm. which was great. Um, you got engaged in my fiance and I now, but my girlfriend at the time, Natalie and I went and, um, it was like a 10 day trip and about, um, five days in, we stayed at the manor where Lewis Carroll wrote a lot of Alice in Wonderland because that's one of her favorite books. Mm -hmm. So I asked her to marry me in that garden oh, where so he cool. would sit and like brainstorm ideas and talk to people about the book and then go home and write. So, um, yeah, we, we, I planned the whole trip around that, but I didn't want to do that first. So I planned like we did, we did like a whole, it was supposed to be like a literature tour. So we went to, <laughs> from London and we went to Bath, which is for, like Jane Austen was lived in Bath for a while. She actually lived outside of Bath, but, um, for most of her life. And then we went to the Cotswolds and that's where we got engaged. And then we went to Wales, um, and then it came home. It was great. That's, po that's beautiful. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. We're, and we're getting married this year too. We're getting married in October. Oh, sweet. Yeah. I'm thrilled. <laughs> what day in October? Uh, the, we're leaving the 13th. We're eloping. So we're leaving the 13th and we get, we're getting married the 16th and we're back the 20th. Beautiful. Yeah. And you're from Tennessee. Yeah. I was born in Nashville, lived in Nashville most of my life. And you said something earlier uh, living in a toxic Southern household. Well, a Southern culture, I'd say um, both my parents are from New York. So, um, they had very sort of Northern personalities. They were both like mm -hmm. sort of boisterous and loud and, um, fun sort of silly people, which I think is where I get it. I get it honestly from both my parents. Both my parents are silly people, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, and fun and also very showy. Um, but I also grew up in the city of Nashville, um, which is a pretty liberal place, but you're still in a very, it's like a blue bubble in a red state. And so a lot of the people I went to school with and were surrounded by, and like a lot of my friend groups had people in it that had very different views on race and gender and sexuality and stuff. And so I grew up at a time when it was like common to use derogatory language all the time. And that's something that I've had to come to grips with and like get over and sort of, you know, work through. You know, yeah, and I, I mean, <laughs> I remember my 10 year reunion. I, I like had a list of three guys I needed to apologize to, and I did that. Like, I because you, it's just the, that that was a much more, it was much more common to use that kind of language then. And I think it's hard for people to realize that, oh man, we should never have talked like that. Like, the, it was, it's not that people are pointing it out now because it's just now become offensive. It's just now reached a critical mass where, like, societally, it's no longer acceptable to yeah, say those like, things. Yeah, it's like, wait, hold on. We're that at doesn't a point mean, yeah, but just because it popped through that bubble of society saying it as not okay doesn't mean it was okay then. Ooh. So, like, that's why I felt the need to apologize for uh, it. You were, you were one of them. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I mean, absolutely. I, I grew up at a time when it was very common to say that kind of yeah. stuff. And again, I'm not saying that that's okay. Like, I don't, I don't think it was right for me to do that. When did it kind of click for you? It was like, wait, that was kind of oh, a dick thing. For shit, me like everything in my life that has been good and healthy, it clicked for me in therapy. <laughs> yeah. Like I start, um, I, I lost a brother when I was 15. So I, oh. I, uh, I went to therapy for a while cause we were in a car wreck and he passed away and, uh, I started to go to therapy pretty young, but specifically for the grief of losing my brother. But that was a very positive experience for me. Mm. And so later in life when I was like, why are all my relationships falling apart? Like, is it, is it me? Like, am I a bad person? And I started asking those questions and honestly, it, my dad being like, yeah, like it is you, you are a bad person. <laughs> I mean, he was very gentle with that message, but his message was more or less, yeah, you probably go to therapy. Um, because when my brother died, he also went to therapy and had a positive experience. But I think that that positive experience for my brother dying and the therapy that came after it, just to be clear though, the positive experience was not my brother dying. <laughs> <laughs> the therapy after it. I just didn't want people to get confused by my sentence construction. <laughs> um, but the therapy after it, I think, was such a positive thing and really helped me process the grief through that, that when I needed to go fix some stuff in myself, I was very willing to go do that. And I specifically, like, I, I went to a few different therapists until I found I specifically wanted, like, an older woman therapist hmm. um, because I feel like some of the stuff I needed to work on were, like, I really wanted like a woman's perspective. Yeah. If that makes sense. And yeah. if you're, um, if you're shopping for a therapist that doesn't challenge you, you're shopping for a validation. And I didn't want that. I wanted like, I wanted someone to be like, what, you know, like, yeah. and do you think that that's like a healthy way of thinking? I needed someone to be that. And 
I still remember her name. I, I mean, her name is Dr. Melinda Lafferty and she did so much. She helped me so much. Yeah. She's uh, I moved to San Diego uh, after seeing her for about two years. And then when I came back, I started therapy again. And now my therapist, Hannah is amazing. Like I see her twice a month. It's great. Yeah. And I, I, she's actually younger than me. And it's, it's interesting, the dynamic, because, um, I feel like the stuff that I worked through with, uh, Dr. Lafferty, my, my first therapist was like some of the ingrained, like misogyny and honestly just racism of the culture I was born into, which I would say is just like general American sort of, for me, it was like Christian values, which I think does skew very masculine and very, you know, patriarchal, Mm -hmm. um, and now in th- which I, I don't know, I think I'll always be sort of working through that because I was born in that, I was born into that box, you know? So like my lens first was that. Yeah. And so I had to sort of work through that. And I think that's going to always be something I'm working with or working through or working to avoid. Um, but now with Hannah, who's younger than me, I'm, I'm processing stuff that like mainly around grief, which yeah. is interesting. Um, but I don't know. I love therapy. I, I hope to always go. I hate that it's something that most people can't, um, unless you're of a certain social class, it's yeah. hard to get into. I hate that. I hate that part of it. I 100%. hate the stigma around it. It's one of the reasons I talk about it on my podcast a lot too. And I have people that like will DM me and be like, Hey, you convinced me to go to therapy because of Honestly, XYZ. the way you're talking about it. I'm like, yeah. Let's fucking go to therapy. Yeah, it's great. Like <laughs> I really do wish people would like, if you break your leg, you're going to go to the doctor. Like right? you can't physically see the broken thing in your mind, but you can feel it most of the time. There are like, there are sociopathic and like the, there are th- things that you might have that you can't see narcissisms like that, but pretty much everything else, you know, Oh shit, I'm depressed. Like something in my life, there's something that happened in my life that I've either repressed or know what it is that I have to work through, or I'm going to live like this. And I can't live like this. And I've been to the point, like I literally, like, uh, I don't know if I'd be here without therapy, you know, like yeah. my dad sort of like came to my house one night and we talked until like 4 a.m. And it was like, you have to go to therapy because he's like, I can't lose another son. And it was so sad, but like, I'm so grateful for that. And I'm like, I lost him in 2017 and like, I'm getting teary eyed because like he saved my life, you know? And that's like, that's like such a special moment. And I'm so glad to have a dad that I miss, you know, but yeah. like, I'm so glad he made me go and bittersweet. Yeah. And I like when I moved to San Diego and the therapist he made me go see was, or he just made me start going. Uh, I didn't find her until a few months later, but La- Dr. Lafferty, like I hugged her before I left and she was like, she gave me her phone number. She's like, if you ever need anything, call me. Like she, I, it was just like, it's great to have a support system of people who like want you to do better and also will hold space for you. And that's what therapy is. They're not going to judge you. They're going to talk to you about like whatever truly traumatic stuff you went through. Um, And everyone's trauma is different. Like mine was, I lost my brother at 15. We were in a car accident, you know, like I have a lot of like survivor's guilt specifically, you know, which is why like the horror movies that we deal with, like that deal with survivor's guilt or like the reason hereditary is the scariest. Have you seen hereditary? It deals with the loss of a sibling in a car accident type situation. So like, that's why it messes me up. Right. I, we hit a phone pole. It's, it's almost exactly the same as what happens in that movie, except the car hit it. Not, well, I don't want to ruin it, but yeah. (laughs) Like no spoilers. Yeah. No spoilers. But (laughs) if you, if you know, you know, you know, yeah. Um, you just got to deal with that stuff or it's going to end up sort of ruining you. Do you, do you go to therapy? Are you so in therapy? Right now I'm in a no therapy moment in my life. Okay. I love therapy. The first time I went to therapy was when I sought treatment for like substance use. Yeah. And then I was going consistently up until like a few months ago when I moved out here. I f- like I've gone through multiple therapists like yeah. in a pretty short amount of time and then my last therapist I didn't feel like was a good fit. Yeah. So now I'm in like this moment of like well, I should just make the phone call. Yeah. And for some reason, I can't pick up the phone just to find a therapist. But it's like, I have shit I need to talk about and like work through. Yeah. But like in the moment, no, I'm not seeking therapy, but I definitely, I know I need to. And I, I just need that like push and somebody just be like, Lysha, go fucking call somebody and yeah, get a therapist right now. I mean, and it's not always available to people. And I do find that some of the, a lot of my moments were like, I've had 
the aha moments that end up changing your perspective on things. Uh, a lot of them I've had in therapy. A lot of them I've had also just talking to my friends and being vulnerable with my friends or my partner. Like um, a lot of times Natalie and I will just sit on our back patio and like with our dogs, Buttercup and Schnucka, not to name drop, but they're the cutest things ever. And, uh, you know, we'll just talk for like hours. We actually that's genuinely, yeah, sure. it, it is. Yeah. And because it's with the person that like it's with your partner, right? So you can be completely vulnerable with that person or hopefully you can. And they can either validate your weirdness or you can work through whatever or, you know. It, Maybe they could call you out on your shit. Yeah, Depends. absolutely. What do you think is, what's like the balance you think with like having a therapist and like a good friend you can like rant to? <laughs> you know what I, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so um, the good thing about a therapist is they're not at all going to try and fix it ever and they will never judge you for it. And socially it will never come back to you. So because you have the layer of um, like HIPAA <laughs> that protects, like even if I saw Hannah out in public, she wouldn't be like, hey, remember this thing we talked about in therapy that was like pretty traumatic? She can't um, even acknowledge that she's your therapist unless you- Well, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I, I probably would because I'm, I'm just like, oh, hey, Hannah, that's my <laughs> therapist. She's great. And she'd be like, <laughs> um, but yeah. So like with your friend group, there is the- and this is different. It's obviously based on everyone's friend group, but like I would be afraid to tell some of my friends some things because I know that it's going to come up because it's funny or it could be portrayed funny or funny? whatever. Yeah, it's because it's funny. It's going to come up. Yeah. Like, like I, I'm not going to share every story <laughs> with uh, a friend group that could use it for laughs. And a that lot of my true. friend group, you know, they're either professional or semi professional comedians that like, also run in the roast battle circle or, you know, other people I've met through doing stuff like this. Honestly, roasting is a love language. It <laughs> is. Oh, point. so I, I roasted one of my best friends in the world. I look up to him so much. He used to be a co-host on the podcast with a page and I, uh, and he took a step back as he started the um, mental health crisis intervention team for all of Nashville. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. He works at a nonprofit um, and they, he pitched the idea of having mental health counselors in police cars to help with people. And it's a lot of people who are addicted to drugs or they're, they've just taken too much meth or they've taken something that's like caused a break. And they, Nashville as a city was trying to lower the number of police incidents. Let's say it that way. And his program has gone very, very far in helping with that. He, um, three years ago started it as just like one precinct trial and now they've moved it and they've expanded it to the entire city. And now the fire department is learning the skills and stuff too. And he just got too busy to stay on the podcast, but I had three really great jokes making fun of him. <laughs> and I, I love this man. He's like a brother to me, but yeah, I definitely made fun of him, but it, it like, it is in a loving way. Like we are just, nobody can hurt you like your friends, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I do yeah. think that there is a level, especially with the audience, they want to feel like they are eavesdropping in a conversation that they are not um, allowed to be a part of because that they have they haven't earned that level of like comfortability with you. So like they are allowed to hear you say things that they wouldn't necessarily normally be right. able to hear. They like to feel in the loop. Yes. And they like to feel like they're eavesdropping on a conversation that's yeah. like a private thing, right? Yeah. Everyone's leaning in and talking and like, like uh, they want to yeah, be a fly on the wall when Mikey yes. called me and like said this thing about me or whatever. Yeah. So it's, it's fun for them to listen to as well. I get why people like it, but it is really just me thinking of the most offensive jokes I could say about Mikey, uh, even though I love him. Yeah. That's what I've learned with like my, my friends here currently in Baltimore. Yeah. I've like picked up on like, oh, you're talking shit about me because you love me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's, I mean, yeah. you'll get that at your day job too. Like if people are teasing you at work, it's because they like and respect what you do. <laughs> like if people aren't teasing you, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. It's just, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Although <laughs> that being said, like teasing can go too far and could be a bad thing. But a lot of times, like you know, if, if it's just like people giving you shit at work, just being silly, they do that because they like and respect you. I um, I, I personally am not like a theist. I, I'm not a believing person. So it's, it's, I think where I get a lot of my peace and solace, that and yoga, I think I get a lot of peace and solace out of, you which said, I know, I know when you, when I walked in, you were like that dude, that white dude who's 40, he's definitely doing yoga. <laughs> But like yoga is great. Like if I could say like we should do more 
like more older white dudes should get into yoga because it's it has chilled me out a lot. Wow. You said you're not a theist. Yeah. You're not atheist. No, I'm not a theist. I, I'm not a believing person. I'm, I don't. What do you mean? Um, a theist is someone who believes in a like divine creator, like God. You don't believe in God. I don't. I'm comfortable not knowing, and I find Ooh. the conversation superfluous. I don't think that there's really a reason to talk about it really? because yeah, I, I, but th- you know, what's funny is I actually do sort of care. Cause I remember those <laughs> questions. Remember those questions I asked before about like when I want all I really want to talk about with people is like, what is your world philosophy and how did you get there? But like not in a, well, your philosophy is wrong and here's why kind For of sure. a way. My interest is like, I want to know why your brain works the way it does and how it ended up with that thought in its head, if that makes sense. Yes. I don't care. I don't like when people are like trying to con- convert me to like any certain belief, yeah, I'm sure. like, okay, do you have any proof? No. Then why are we talking about it? Like, can we just, can you just tell me what you believe and not try and get me to like, give me 10, give you 10% of my income. Like it yeah. would be just fun to have a conversation, like a thought experiment conversation with you about what life is like. And is it purgatory? Like that kind of stuff. That's like, it's like vulnerable and I don't know. I find those conversations more fun yeah. than just like a man. I heard this joke the other day, kind of conversation. Yeah. Um, but I don't really. I know logically what's going to happen to my body when I die, and I'm comfortable with that. Do I think my consciousness survives outside of that in an afterlife state? I have no idea. Do we have any evidence to prove that it does? No. So do I find arguing with someone about whether they should or should not believe worth it? No. Because listen. I don't necessarily believe that God exists and there is an afterlife, but man, wouldn't it be great if it was true? Like, I I don't understand atheists who are like, because I I would probably put myself in the atheist category, but I also like for people who believe, I get it, man. It's super comforting. Like, I don't see anything wrong with it at all. It's just, I struggle with not, there's just no, there's no way to know. So I find the whole argument over it's kind of silly. Yeah. Like come to me with proof and then we'll, we can argue about the proof or I whatever. I love the way you're articulating like, this so much. Well, what do you mean? What do you mean? I just love the way you're saying it. Cause like, I, I understand, like I really understand where your head's at with it for yeah. sure. And it's like, now I'm like thinking about, cause like when somebody says they're an atheist, I don't like subscribe to any religion, but I do believe there sure. is a God. Yeah. I do think there's something that connects us all, right? I think there's something to manifesting and then actually doing the work that I think like people say, oh, it's the power of prayer or it's I put the intention out there in the universe and they're virtually saying the same thing. It's just the way the words they're using are different, you know? So I think that there is something to that. There is something ethereal that we can't touch. There is something to fate, you know, there's something about it. But I find the arguments about it very boring Yeah, because- they're all based in belief and there's nothing based in fact. And so why are we arguing? Can't we just like, yeah, we both... can't like really make yeah. a valid argument. Like here. the fact that you're a theist and I'm an atheist doesn't offend me at all. I think that's great. I want you to believe whatever makes you comfortable and happy. Yeah. Like it's weird to me that like someone would want to argue with me because of a belief because yeah. we can have different beliefs and you know who that affects? Nobody, <laughs> you know, like when you put those beliefs into actions or legislation, that is where I start to have a problem with it because you are now forcing someone to do something that is not their belief and doesn't hurt anybody if they don't believe it, you know? So, but largely I find the arguments about religion silly. It is. It's funny. It is a comfort thing. It's very comforting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I lost my dad in 2017. He had, uh, we grew up very religious. He was very religious. So we had a very religious funeral for him and that's all that we talked about was that it was comforting that he knew he was going to be with Jesus, you know, that kind of stuff. And that's the kind of funeral my dad wanted. And I went up and said all of that and said all of those words because that's what his, the audience at his funeral needed and wanted. Yeah. Has nothing to do with me. Whether I believe it or not, it doesn't matter. I needed to make sure that I honored his wishes in that, you know? Yeah. Doesn't change what I believe, but. I was delivering his message that day. So did you see what I'm saying? Like I I can not believe and still understand the benefit of believing and why people do believe. And truly I would like to believe. (laughs) I would love for there to be proof of an afterlife. Do you know how comforting that would be? 
it's just hard for me to get there without proof. Yeah. But I have a lot of love. Like I grew up very religious. All of my, my fiance's family is very religious. And I, I say, I can like respect. Yeah. I don't believe in God, but do I say amen every time her dad prays for dinner? Yeah, I do. I don't see anything wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But the arguments and fighting over people over it just seems silly to me. I just want to like people and I want to learn how they think and why they think that way. That is amazing. I really want to thank you for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great. I feel like this was a really good conversation. I hope I'm so. happy about it. Like, I'm very happy about it. It was so good. Robbie tried to break in. Yeah. Robbie wanted to be involved. <laughs> and I was like, there isn't a chair here for you right now. <laughs> this is the context we talked about earlier and being obsessed with it. Yeah. And that, my friends, is a callback. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, I really appreciated this. Thank a lot. you so much. I think more than you might know. Oh, well, great. Well, yeah. we should do it again. <laughs> <laughs> happy to listen. Happy to like, I, I don't really have a space where I can come and talk about this sort of stuff in a like long form, non silly way. Yeah. Cause my podcasts are very like focused on movies and we're talking through the plot of the movies and things we thought were silly it's and very, stuff like, like that. like we're sticking to this. Yeah. We have a formula. So it's, it's, it's nice to have a place where I'm not just interjecting like, Oh, this is a thing I learned in therapy or whatever, yeah. you know, I can actually just sort <laughs> of talk about it. And much more nice. open ended and we love a good therapy talk. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for, for coming from Nashville. Yeah. Happy Thank to make you. the trip. 